Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Fantasy Football Predictive Analytics with Reese. And we are jazzed to have Adam Harstad with us. Adam, how's it going? Uh, pretty good. How about you guys? We're awesome. We met Adam. I'd met Adam in person before, but we met Adam this summer in Chicago, had some deep dish pizza in the pouring down rain. We were inside a cover, kind of, kind a of. cover and had some Lou Malnati's. Is that how you pronounce it? Yep. And uh, anyway, it was great. Yes. So let's jump straight in because small talk, small talk. All right, Adam, I have a couple questions before we get into this and you'll laugh at these. So on the old school fancy football or football guys boards, you were SSOG, right? I was. What does SSOG stand for? What did that, what was that? Whatever you want it to stand for. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was, um, I got on the internet when I was, I think, 15. And like all 15 year olds, I thought that I, uh, I, had, I let's just say I had a very high opinion of myself. And um, some people would joke and say, you know, what do you think you are? Some sort of genius. So my first AOL instant messenger screen name was some sort of genius. Like all 15 year olds, I eventually became a 16, 17 and 18 year old. And I realized that perhaps this was not really the type of persona that I wish to be portraying to the rest of the world. Um, so I wound up, I got accepted into the University of Florida, who are the Gators. So I changed yep. it to some sort of Gator. And then over the years, you know, like I, it changed through a couple other variations. And then eventually it just became a series of initials that could stand for whatever you want to stand for. It's, it's just, it's kind of like XKCD, the uh, web blog, where it's just, you know, a unique four letter uh, point in space. Because you were on Football Guys uh, message board for a long time. I mean, I was, I was member or number fifteen hundred, which I thought I was pretty proud of myself. But now I'm like, or what, right? Yeah. But you were on there for a long time. Chris Wessling was there at Fear and Loathing. I mean, there were a lot of guys in the industry that even uh, Ryan McDowell was Jeter twenty three. And so, uh, anyway, yeah, people will ask me, you know, how do you get into the fantasy football industry? And I say, I don't know how you will. I mean, I know it worked for me, but unless you have a time machine and you can get back on the football guys message boards circa 2005, it's probably not going to be very actionable advice because that's, I mean, that's just where the people were at the time. Oh, yeah. And, and this sound, so I love Twitter. Other than during this election time, it's not as much fun, but, um, you know, it was a, hardcore collection of individuals at that time and it was kind of it was kind of cool to have nerdy football conversations but anyway i had one of my favorite somebody once said that um fantasy football was a lot more fun before the nerds got a hold of it <laughs> and i said Bef before the nerds like who do you think was sitting around and saying you know football's really fun but you know it would make it more fun spreadsheets <laughs> that, that that was not not the nerds right. that, that, that was the nerds the nerds invented fantasy sports i hate to break it to you some of the, some of you later to the party types but there was no fantasy football before the nerds right and people act like all 22 tape has been around forever you know right. and that's it hasn't and so i mean i was in my first league a long time ago and you know early 90s and so Anyway, I'm a big, I'm a, I enjoyed the Gators as well for the SEC. I had an uncle that was a vice president there for many years. So anyway, I always vicariously followed the Gators. So let's jump into fantasy football. What was your first, you like building models. You like figuring stuff out. Is that fair? Um, I make little rinky things and then I like calling them models because it makes me sound more put together than I really am. <laughs> All right, which one was your first one to put together? Um, in terms of- What, in terms what of, problem were you trying to solve when you put your first one together? Um, I would say the first big data set I ever worked with um, was I, I built out historical fantasy value for players um, all the way back to 1985. And I didn't really know what I was gonna do with it. I mean, part of it was just curiosity, but I wound up doing a lot of good stuff with that. I do a lot of um, historical, historically comparable players out of it. Um, I did a lot of work on career aging patterns out of it. Um, 
but before that it was mostly i mean it, it wasn't really models so much as i'd have a question like who's good at running the ball on third and short and the answer is everybody but Legarrette Blunt, um, or, you know, who's, who's whatever. And, and I'll look up one specific question, but I wasn't really playing with uh, the data, so to speak. Well, now you have like pro football reference to, to answer that question, because I believe they have drop downs that will say uh, third and short, what happens. I, I'm pretty- this might blow your mind. Uh, football guys actually had data queriers before pro football reference back in the day um, when I first started at football guys that was one of the best reasons to subscribe is we had the the um data dominator and the historical data dominator that had a lot of the same stuff that the pro football reference stuff had and then pro football reference dropped theirs and we're like well you know not as much point to developing ours out as much um but we still have them and there's um actually there's one good use case i like um one of the football guys choirs lets you sort by one stat divided by another stat Oh. So if you want to know like what quarterback has the most passing yards for every rushing yard or the most rushing yards for every passing yard, um, we have the only thing that can really easily do that. Good old Dr. Drennan, huh? Yep. Good old Dr. Doug. People don't get, people don't know him, but he is a bright dude behind the scenes. He's a PhD math. Mm-hmm. Adam, I've told this story many times. And if you've heard this, forgive me and you can, you can shut it down. But Dr. Drennan, I, when I first came on staff, I saw his OSU uh, avatar, you know, mm-hmm. on the site. So I ping him and I say, hey, Doc, you're an OSU guy, because that's where I went. And uh, it ends up that we're both from Tulsa. I'm a couple years older, and he lived on the street directly behind me, behind us, and our house is almost backed up to each other which is like the craziest thing to meet on football guy staff and then have us, and he lives in Tennessee. Right. Weird, weird coincidence. Yep. All right. So let's dive into your models, your age adjusted model. Do you want to take this one? Or do you want me to jump in? Here you go. What, what are the, what's the biggest aha you've had on the age adjusted? Has it been, or right, what position? How about that? We'll get, <laughs> we'll go down that path. Well, so I think the biggest thing about age, um, and so, you know, I got into Dynasty around 2007, and in 2007, people just didn't really think about age. Um, In my Dynasty startup, I think Sean Alexander was 30 years old and coming off of a down year, and he went in the second round of the startup, um, which would never happen today. Nobody's taking a 30-year-old running back who's clearly in decline in the second round of a startup. Um, Ladanian Tomlinson is coming off a monster year, but he was like 28 and he was the number one pick. Um, so people just weren't thinking about age at all. And then all of the workhorses got old kind of all at the same time. Um, and everybody got burned by it. And so then people started using something called age curves, which they look at, you know, how does the average 22 year old do the average 23 year old, the average 24 year old. And if you plot it all out, it looks kind of like a curve, you know, they improve, they improve, they improve, they improve, they hit their peak, they decline, they decline, they decline, they decline. Um, And that's all well and good. Um, But I've, I was never really comfortable with that because if you look at NFL careers, um, they're almost never curve shaped. They just aren't. I mean, if you average every NFL player together, you get a curve. If you look at any individual NFL player, it's almost never a curve. Um, and, and so once I built out my historical value um, database, I was able to actually look at that. And I'm like, you know, what does aging actually look like? Um, and so one of the first questions I asked is, if you look at a player's last fantasy relevant year, and then you look at his second to last fantasy relevant year, you know, if careers are curve shaped, you would think the last year would be worse than the second to last year, right? Because they're declining, they're declining, they're declining, then they're done. Um, but it's 50-50. It's, it's about a 50% shot, whether they will be better in their last year or worse in their last year, which is crazy. It's mind blowing. It's not, right. the careers aren't curve shaped. Instead, really what's happening is players are kind of just cruising along at a set level. You know, they, they ascend, they reach their peak and they basically just stay at that level. Um, and produce at that level until at some point, and we don't really know what that point is going to be, but at some point, they're going to fall off the cliff. You know, you think about Des Bryant. Des Bryant was an all pro, and then like overnight, he's an 800 yard receiver. He's just done. Um, and so that was really my big aha moment is when I started playing with that and I started changing the way I was thinking about aging in the first place. 
Um, and instead of looking at it as like orderly curves, um, I, I took a page out of life insurance and they use something called mortality tables, yeah. uh, which the idea is that um, if you want to, if I want to sell life insurance to somebody who's 60 years old and I want, I want to know what are the odds that this person survives to seven, you have like a percentage change every year that that person dies or, or for fantasy purposes that that person falls off a cliff and the older they get, the higher but it's never a certainty, you know, just because somebody's old doesn't mean, you know, he's going to fall off a cliff. You get occasionally you get a guy like Jerry Rice who's still producing at age 40. Um, so that was the big aha for me was just changing how I was modeling aging and declines in the first place. Is there a way that you can predict when someone falls off a cliff? Um, it's hard. Uh, it's hard because it's different for everyone. Um, and, and the reason I call it a cliff is, is because it's not, I mean, it could be anything. And retired, you know, it, who could have predicted that? Who could predict that? Who could have predicted what the end would have looked like for him? Um, you get somebody like Des Bryant, who, like I said, he's an all pro. He's showing no signs of decline. He's 28 years old. You think he's just reaching his prime and then he's done. Um, you know, Tory Holt was going along great. All of a sudden he's got degenerative cartilage issues. Um, and then on the other hand, you have Larry Fitzgerald who he he's struggling in a bad Arizona offense. And then he has a late career Renaissance and he's having some of his best seasons at 34, 35 years old. Um, so it, it's hard to predict exactly because you don't even know what it's going to look like. Is it going to be retirement? Is it going to be injury? Is it going to be loss of effectiveness? Is it going to be, you know, is he going to get traded to another team where it's not, it's not a career fit and that's going to derail his career. You think about like Namdi Asamoa in the, the cornerback from Oakland. Yeah. He was an all pro cornerback for the Oakland Raiders, best cornerback in the NFL. Uh, he goes to Philadelphia and pretty much overnight He's done because he was a man quarterback in Philadelphia, ran his own scheme. Um, so no, I, I and I kind of, I, I kind of like not trying to predict. I kind of like just saying, look, there's this global risk, and I can quantify that that risk gets higher the older you get. But I don't know, I don't know what the end's going to look like for anybody. I mean, look at Rob Gronkowski. You, you thought for sure, you know, he's reached to the end. And now he's back and he's scoring touchdowns and, you know, maybe he's a top 10 tight end again after a year out of the NFL. You just, you just never know what careers are going to look like. And you mentioned Cliff and I, I use this when I talk to him about health, right? You know, we all right. think that it's a bell curve and, you know, the right. same, the same rate that you get bigger, stronger when you're a kid, that it's going to be the same when you age. And it's not like that there's these defining moments in people's health. You know, they say 90% of your, your life's hospital bills come in the last year of your life. And so I'm around a lot of older people, but you know, they, it's just interesting like that. And I think it's the same with injuries, you know, like whenever the big mi major injury is, that's pretty near to that. Some players, the end of their career. And so uh, anyway, it's just interesting. You have another question for him. So Kind of shifting gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, who do you believe should get MVP? I mean, there's been Russell Wilson was a front runner. Now he's he's played average, a little bit higher than average. Still top ten quarterback, but he's kind of declining a little bit. Not not off to his historic pace. And some people are saying it should be Murray or others. Who do you believe should get it? Well, I'm generally of the idea. Um, that Patrick Mahomes is going to be the best quarterback in the NFL pretty much every year until, you know, he retires or somebody gives me reason to believe otherwise. Um, but MVP is a descriptive award. Um, it's not necessarily who's the best quarterback. Uh, it's who had the best season. Um, there's a lot of football left to be played. If I were placing bets, I would probably bet on Mahomes just because again I think he's the best quarterback but in terms of who's done the most through the first eight weeks I think it's Wilson um, and I don't know that Mahomes is far enough ahead of Wilson that he'll be able to overcome that in the last eight weeks it, it kind of remains to be seen I think for me MVP means with the, how far a team would go without that player so I don't 
if I'm going to go with that, I'd go with Donald. But of course, I'm not going to vote for Donald. I'd vote for Wilson. So it's kind well, of, I think if, if they, of, I think if that's your criteria, you might have to give it to Dak. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Especially in Dallas. Especially because you used to live in Dallas. Yeah. And uh, talk about know, falling off a cliff for the Cowboys. Can you imagine yeah. being his agent and talking to Jerry now? So uh, let's, you know, because he's going to get hit with the second tag at worst this coming year. Yeah. And Dallas, that's the last one they can use on him. And yep. so, you know, if I'm him, I would go, guys, I, you better make it in a nice incentivized offer for me to sign anything. None of this lowball stuff because they have the weapons and it is what it is. Speaking of the Cowboys, I'm sure you follow them reasonably. Uh, what do you think they should do with? Cooper and Gallup and because uh, Lamb's a great player you know I mean he's, he's he's showing a lot of potential should they keep both uh Cooper and Gallup and no, I mean my thoughts and this is kind of the same answer I give anytime anybody asks me a dynasty trade question they say are you buying this guy or are you selling this guy and my answer is always buy the guys when the value is there sell the guys when the value is there I think if I were running an NFL team, it'd be the same. You know, if, if I can get Cooper for a deal that makes sense for my franchise, that, that I think is commensurate to the value he brings to my team, then absolutely lock him up, lock up Gallup, lock up all of them. Um, if the cost of doing so is going to be prohibitive or if it's going to, if I'm going to be damaging the rest of my team in the process, then you got to let him walk. But on that, so like Green Bay during the Jordy Nelson years, I thought did a great job because they would re-sign him two years early, right? So you have this guy on a rookie deal, he's second rounder, you sign him after two years or whenever you first can. He loves getting this front-loaded money and now you have him under contract. You know, but Dallas lets them all get to the end and now you have very little pl uh, flexibility and if they're playing well, you have no leverage. But even... Go. Yeah, that's okay. I, I think Green Bay also had an advantage. I think uh, both Cobb and Nelson took a little bit of below market deals to stay with them. I mean, I think they had, um, I think people liked being there and and were a little bit more flexible on the money as a result, which makes it easier for you. Yeah, but also when you do it earlier, it's easy to be flexible because you're getting money up front versus second round pick. And I the think. salary cap is, the sal uh, you can pay less because record, big extensions Extensions are going up. Yeah. We, if you told me us two years ago, someone's going to sign a half billion dollar extension, we tell them that they're crazy. But now with the extensions going up, you get a low ball offer, which yeah. you make it looks like a steal. Because well, I still think I still think Mahomes is crazy for signing a ten year deal. I agree, agree. Because but, it's going up 10, 15 percent a year, right. and I mean, don't you think? Although who knows with the pandemic, it's probably not going to for a little bit. Right, yeah. but Dak should only sign a three year deal, right? But I think, you know, it depends on what matters to him. If, if he's looking to maximize his earnings, three years would probably do that. You want to get another big contract um, right around age 30. Um, but, you know, I kind of, and I get where Mahomes is coming from with the 10 year deal where like, I could do this again in four years, but I don't want to do it again in four years. I'll just, you know, like, let's, I'm, I'm content to be here for the next decade. Let's make it happen. Oh yeah. Andy's in a great situation. Andy Reid good set of weapons it's a pretty good situation so on the nfl big broad question how do you think they're handling the COVID? do you think it's uh i mean with the protocols the you know all the and i don't want to use the word modeling in the same way that we were talking about ages but you know they're they have a plan do you think it's been a, a wise plan do you think they've implemented it well um I mean, they haven't missed any games yet, which is a, which is an accomplishment in and of itself. We've got half a season down, and I think if you had asked me before the season, you know, it, halfway through the season, would we have missed any games at all? I would have thought, yeah, absolutely. Of course, we would have missed some somewhere. Something would have happened, um, and we managed to avoid that. And and largely, um, other than uh, the Titans, we haven't really had that many seriously concerning. Um, situations where where we were really wondering if we were going to lose a game. Um, I still think, uh, you know, if you asked me eight weeks ago if they would have made it eight weeks without missing a game, I would have said no. If you ask me today if they're going to make it another eight weeks without missing a game, uh, again, I would say no, um, especially with spread increasing in the United States. Um, 
I have a feeling we're going to get if I were if I were a betting man and I'm not, but if I were, I would bet that we're going to see some abbreviated seasons. We're going to see some teams playing 14, 15 games instead of 16 games. Um, I think you're going to have teams making the playoffs based on winning percentage instead of total wins. Um, I'm okay with that. I'm a big history buff. And for the first 20, 30 years of the league's existence, that's how they did it. Um, and I could tell you some some wild stories about the, the early days of the NFL and these disparate schedules they used to play. Um, but I kind of think the NFL came into it with the mindset that we're going to get the games that we're going to get. And I know people keep saying you know, oh, they need to, they need to like take a week off. They need to reset. They need to start over, you know, they need to change their plan in midstream. Um, but I've always been like, if, if they can safely play, I think they need to bank as many games as they can bank now, because right. who knows how many games they'll be able to bank later on. Especially as teams that have already had their bond, you lose right. flexibility. And so I do right. think that there's a chance that we'll see maybe a one week by across the season yeah i mean just a one week pause or something like that yeah they've there, there's been talk about adding like an extra week between week 17 and the playoffs and that anybody who needs to make up a game that that would just be a blanket uh week for anybody to make up any games that need to be made up yeah I mean, but yeah i mean my thought is if if you've got like three games that are compromised and you can't play them um, but you've still got like another 12 games that are good. Play the good games while you can, you know, yeah. don't reschedule those because who knows if they'll be good a week from now. Like just, just take the games you can take now and get as many in. They need 256 for a complete season. I don't think they're going to get 256. I think if they can get, you know, 220, it was a very successful season. Yeah. For me, I think uh, team outbreaks, like with the Titans, we all thought, well, the COVID re- last two weeks, for, uh, for a person for everybody quarantine two weeks is two games so one week would not be enough and i guarantee the <laughs> nfl pa will not be happy if they have to play two games in one week so i right. believe if they're going to do a, an extra week i believe they, sh- they should make it an extra two weeks because the nfl pa would not be happy with but, them playing two two games a week yeah but the other piece to that is the nfl's been really uh digging in their heels about not wanting to push back the Super Bowl, which right. is kind of interesting to me because to Adam, I defer to you because you may know something I don't, but having it that the week in February that they do just seems arbitrary. <laughs> like one week further back or two doesn't doesn't seem like if it disrupts anything since they're not going to have their Pro Bowl anyway. Well, it is arbitrary. They've had it in January before. They've had it various other points. Yeah. Um, and they've, I mean, they've had a week by before the Super Bowl. They've not had a week by before the Super Bowl. They've done they've done it a lot of different ways. They've done Pro Bowl after the Super Bowl, Pro Bowl before the Super Bowl. This year, no Pro Bowl at all. Um, so a lot of that is arbitrary. But I think probably their thinking is that, you know, a random whatever Patriots Broncos game in the middle of the season, especially with no or or very limited fan attendance, um, the logistics of that are not that big of a deal. If you want to move that game that's not a big deal. The Super Bowl, the logistics are a big deal. I mean, people are, I don't know what kind of travel they're expecting for the Super Bowl. Um, I don't know what they're expecting the festivities to look like in the host city, but there's a lot of planning. Um, even if even if they're not doing the typical week before festivities, I'm assuming there's still going to be a halftime show. Um, you know, they need to get the act for that. They need to get a lot of stuff set up for that. Um, I'm sure they've got their advertising partners. And so I, I imagine a lot of it is just logistics where there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and those decisions can't be made until they know when it is. And so it behooves them to just lock in a week um, and, and everything else can kind of move, but to have that week locked in. That's, that's a good point of view. And you know, it's interesting. Everybody talks about revenue and yes, the NFL is missing out on a lot of in-game, you know, in-stadium revenue. But if you add up all the TV contracts and divide it by teams, you still get more than the salary cap. And so people don't realize the teams are plus money before the first game even starts just because of TV revenue. Well, but I mean, they have other expenses too. Even if there's nobody in the stadiums, you still got to do upkeep for them. You've still got, um, you know, non-salary cap payroll. You've got all your coaching staff. You've got, you know, the the people who um, like the strength and conditioning coach, you've got, Got the groundskeeper, but you also right. have 
merchandise that they sell and they still have you know other non non tv revenue as well and so all i was getting at is as long as they pay play 17 weeks or more the tv revenue will be up because even if you lose one game or two games a week the right. last three or four it's not going to impact your tv revenue right well also part of the main reason uh one o'clock Sunday game does not get near as much watch time as a Thursday night game. Even if the Thursday night game is terrible, like Broncos Jets. I'm a Broncos fan, and that 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 does not sound like a fun game to watch. But they always but, put bad ones on Thursday nights. Well, they put every team on Thursday night. Every team in the league gets one Thursday night game. So, yeah. But <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is, if they move it to, you know. Because they're not going to put it in the middle of TV broadcasting for Fox because then that disrupt them. Right. But they're going to move it to 7 o'clock. A lot more people will watch, therefore making Fox more incentivized to move it. Because like that Tuesday night game got great ratings a couple weeks ago. Even though it was a blowout. All right, let's get back into Dynasty, Adam. Since I'm a Dynasty fan and you are too, how are you implementing your models in the way that it impacts how you um, – run your dynasty teams how, how are you what tactical things are you doing to your teams because of the knowledge on age curves and things of that nature so i mean we talk about models i i say a lot um i tend to run more on heuristics than projections so heuristics are are simple rules of thumb um and and there's a lot of science and a lot of studies that in highly complex situations a lot of times simple rules of thumb tend to outperform more complicated models um and and so you know at its most basic my entire dynasty philosophy boils down to Guys, who are you? Somebody. Some had Johnu Smith, Austin Hooper. Every dynasty ranking I saw, um, but uh, Johnu Smith higher than Austin Hooper in in Football Guys rest of season projections, and Johnu Smith was a year younger than Austin Hooper. And I ask myself, okay, so if Johnu Smith is younger and Johnu Smith is more productive, why would I prefer the other guy? So I traded Austin Hooper for John o. Smith, um, and it was, at, like I said, at the time, it was against consensus, pretty much universally against consensus. But I think since then, the consensus has completely flopped. I, I don't think that would be controversial at all today. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to do, um, I feel like is that, you know, like Josh Jacobs, 22 years old, was drafted very highly, is projected as a top five redraft running back, you know, there's probably there's arguably not a better combination of age and production in the NFL right now than Josh Jacobs. And yet you see a lot of dynasty rankings that have him running back eight, running back nine. And so, you know, of course I'll, I'll trade some guys who are older and less productive for the guy who's younger and more productive. That's, that's a pretty simple rule of thumb. Um, and I can put math behind it. I, I have formulas I can use that will create dynasty values and, um, I can do the math. It's a lot of work and I'm pretty lazy. So I usually don't do the math. A lot of times I just go by the rule of thumb, um, but it's nice to know it's there if I ever want to go with it. It's kind of like the Bill Gates quote. If you have a hard problem, you always hire a lazy person because they'll find the easiest path to it, right? Totally. And so uh, my son, of course, says, yes, let's apply this to everything in life, like chores. And <laughs> let's just find the laziest path to it. I don't, this, your son does not see a problem. I understand, but his mother may. Um, nice. All right. So on dynasty, so you bring up a good point. And, you know, if we're looking at a position that doesn't have a lot of longevity, like running back, and we factor a little bit of age, we should be looking at it pretty close to a redraft mindset, don't you think? I mean, like, if the average age of the career is only like three or four years, age, matters but you know a 21 year old running back versus a 27 year old running back may have the same length of career left is that reasonable well they may i mean i think um i think people underrate how long running back careers actually tend to be if you look at it 
Um, and so when I, I ran the numbers and I did my mortality tables and I, I have a formula for expected years remaining, you know, and it's based. So, I mean, part of the difficulty is you need, you need a reference class of people. You know, if I'm looking at like bad rookie wide receivers drafted in the sixth round, expected years remaining is like one, they're going to wash out, you know, they're, they're nobodies. Um, if I'm looking at hall of fame, wide receivers, expected years remaining is 15 because they're hall of famers and you don't make the hall of fame in, in, you know, fewer than 10 years. Um, and so the benchmark I used was, I, I call them second contract guys. These are guys basically who are good enough to get a second contract in the NFL to be a starter somewhere might be with their original team might be with a new team, but someone somewhere is going to give them starter money in a second contract to be a starter for them. Um, and it could be anyone from, you know, like Jerry Rice got a second contract, or it could be like, you know, Austin Hooper just got a second contract. Hayden Hurst is probably a second contract guy. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty broad range, but looking at second contract guys in terms of career longevity, I find that running backs typically have about as many years remaining as a wide receiver, about two and a half years older. So a 21 year old running back would, I would expect them to have more career left than a 24 year old wide receiver, but less than a 23 year old wide receiver. Um, so they have, I mean, they still have a pretty substantial careers left. But then it gets into workload, right? So a receiver. I, I don't believe in workload. I think workload's a myth. Well, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it with uh, the amount of touches as opportunities for um, for fantasy scoring. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. because not every running back in every situation, first contract versus second, is going to get the same opportunity right. to score points. You know, I look at a Matt Breida or a Jordan Howard versus uh, someone else. You know what I mean? Like, it's it, it may shift over their career. Carlos well, but I'd point out, I, I mean, I don't think Matt Breda was signed to be a starter. I think he was signed to be a backup. Um, you know, he's kind of on that fringe. Like, yes, he got a second contract, but it's not like a team was giving him $8 million a year and saying, you're the guy. Um, I think more someone like a Mark Ingram would probably be a better example of a, of a second contract guy where there was that expectation that, you know, you would be the primary at, at, at the very least the 1A as opposed to just another piece in a committee. But Jordan Howard got decent money and then in philadelphia started. yeah yeah but it's it's all about a range of outcomes i mean you right. know jordan howard like if if a, if i think a, a 24 year old running back has three and a half expected years remaining that means if you give me 50 24 year old running backs some of them might be done in a year right. some of them might last another eight years you know it there's there's a very broad range of possible outcomes um, and the example i always use is when i got into dynasty the big debate was Larry Fitzgerald versus Andre Johnson versus Calvin Johnson. And I believe Calvin Johnson was 22 at the time. Larry Fitzgerald was 24 and Andre Johnson was 26. And people would say like, oh, you know, Calvin Johnson, we're less certain that he's good at this point, but he will have the most years remaining. And he retired first of the three of them, <laughs> you know, uh, Andre Johnson was done as a fantasy asset first. He, he he had a few hanger on years, but but Larry Fitzgerald blew the others away in terms of how much longer he lasted. So it's not a simple, it's not that deterministic. Just because you're young doesn't mean you're going to have a lot of career left. Des was done by thirty, um, but it's it's a you have to think about it as like a probabilistic range of outcomes. You could you could have a guy who looks like he's going to have a lot of time left and he has nothing. Um, Jordan Cameron, the tight end, I thought would have had several years left. And it, you know, it's, or on the other hand, I think the counterpoint would be Darren Waller, who easily could have fizzled out after one year, but now it's looking like he has staying power. There's, there's always a lot of risk and uncertainty. Um, but in aggregate, um, you know, if you ran this out 50 times, this is about what you would expect. And Jordan Reed had just the same similar, or not that the same concussions, but I mean, the same thing as Jordan Cameron. Right. I'm glad you right. mentioned range of outcomes on a spectrum because I have yeah. found that, especially in the numerical analytics community, we're dealing with pretty small sample sizes, you know, and then we have these definitive, they either are great or they stink. And we're really saying on a one to 10 scale, I think they're a seven this year and they could be an eight or a four next year. You know what I mean? Like, right it's on a scale, it's, it's not binary. 
Did, did you have and that's that's really what I like about mortality tables against age curves because I think age curves give a false sense of security you know well he's young so he'll be better next year you know he's old so he'll be worse next year um, whereas mortality table says you know who knows you, you, you just no clue what you're going to get right but there's a 63 percent chance that right. this happens and a 10 percent chance this happens and goes on down the road down the line and and then we have to anchor ourselves to whichever one of those seems the most likely to us. Yes. Uh, speaking of which, with Carol's injury, who's your top five dynasty tight ends? Uh, I was actually just tweeting about this earlier. Uh, Hawkinson is my new number one. Um, and it's, it's pretty close. Um, you know, I could be talked into a couple other guys and in certain leagues or with certain team setups, maybe somebody else makes more sense. You know, if, if um, it's a, got a big bench and I've got some other tight ends behind him, maybe I prefer Waller, but, but what it boils down to is Hawkinson is 23 um, football guys. Bob Henry projects him as a top four tight end going forward. There's nobody who's younger and better. No offense. The only other guy under 25 who's in the top 10. It's Hawkinson and Fant. And then everybody else in the top 10 is 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. Um, so I think Kittle gives you a larger relative advantage, but Kittle, um, I think he's going to be 29 the next time he sees the field. Um, so for me, Hawkinson would be number one. Uh, I would probably still have Kittle number two. Um and then Fant, I mentioned, would be up there. Mark Andrews, uh, he's another guy who's under 25, Andrews. Um, Hawkinson, Fant, and Andrews are basically the only tight ends right now who are both good and, and substantially young, um, younger than 25. Um, so I'd have Hawkinson, Kittle, Andrews, Fant, and um, I think the number five would be a tough one. I could see going with someone like um, Dallas Godair. Um, if you really wanted to to take a flyer, shoot for the moon. Um, I wouldn't have a problem with anybody who went with Kittle, um, or not with Kittle, with Kelsey, uh, just because he provides such a huge short-term advantage, especially with, with Kittle out. Um, I don't think there's anybody who gets you anywhere in the same stratosphere as, as Kelsey for the next year. Um, and if he hangs on, two years, three years. That's great. Um, he's 31. I tend to think that tight ends age at best, the same as wide receivers at worst, a little harder than wide receivers. So who knows how long he's still going to be giving this relative advantage, but I could, I could see an argument for somebody who just said the other tight ends are not giving enough of an advantage to overcome just the massive gap that Kelsey's giving right now. It's also depend on your team makeup. That's a really good question. Um, Godair or Goddard's the one I have that's really high and uh because it caused a stink because I pushed him over Ertz a month ago and everybody's hanging on to Ertz I'm like I just don't you know at this stage in his career I just don't see having him up that high he doesn't offer you that much relative advantage uh given his right. age but Kelsey and, Go and Godard is predicted I mean surprisingly high I, I think Bob Henry has him like 12th at his going forward rankings. So he's another guy who's both good and young. Yeah, and he's right at 25, right? I think so. Yeah. Well, with Kelsey, he, he has Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid for a while. I don't really see him not being a focal point of the offense for a long time unless they draft a replacement when like Kyle Pitts or Friar Move falls greatly. Revan Jordan, yeah. One of those guys. That's right. the next side in class is pretty good. All right. How about, I mean, you look at like Randy Moss had Tom Brady and Bill Belichick for a while too. And that's, that's the thing about cliffs is if we could see him coming, you know, <laughs> I would, I would be a much wealthier man than I am. It's I, 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 I try to have a lot of respect for the uncertainty because I know that in the past when I've been sure about things, the universe has a way of humbling me. I'm with you because we're all dealing in probabilities. That's why the, there's nothing to be either overly uh, arrogant or overly humble about because we're all dealing with probabilities and what we think is going to happen. There are no sure things, you know? And right. uh, so we talked about top five tight ends. 
How about your top five dynasty wide receivers? Because this is an age versus production type of question. So this is a fun one for me. And I've actually been giving a lot of thought to this one recently. Um, and so my top two are DK Metcalf and AJ Brown. Um, I'm not really sure on the order. I know community has Metcalf. If I'm, if I'm drafting in a startup and I'm taking a wide receiver, I take Metcalf just because I think he has higher market value and that gives me more options. But if I were in a no trade dynasty league, if such a thing existed, I'm not, I'm not really sure who I'd take there. I like them both. Um, and then after that, I think you get into some really big and interesting questions um, because you have, on the one hand, you have Michael Thomas, Devontae Adams, and DeAndre Hopkins, who uh, give you just such a huge short-term relative advantage. Um, and for some reason, I, I feel like every year it gets younger and younger where people are declaring people old. I remember when 27 years old was a young wide receiver. Right. I remember when like 30 was an old wide receiver and 27 is still three years away from that. But people are, are they're getting off of Hopkins and, and um, Adams and Thomas, even though they're 27, 28. Um, but I also see when you have young guys um, who are the, so let's see, I, I want to make sure I'm not forgetting anybody. CD Lamb's going to be up there. Justin Jefferson's going to be up there. Um, uh, hang on. I probably have a list somewhere. Um, I really like Terry McLaurin. I don't know that I'd have him quite top five. I think he's more in the six to 10 range. I have him at four. I have him at four, which is, you know, just because controversial, but he's doing it with Haskins and Kyle Allen right. throwing to him, you know, <laughs> imagine him with fields. I've been, I've been hammering on this since the summer that, you know, a guy in his second year should, you know, who is, who is drafted reasonably highly, who had a good rookie year should not be going higher in redraft than dynasty should not be happening. Shouldn't be. Agreed. And, and McLaurin was um, projected at like 12th in redraft and he's like wide receiver 19 in dynasty. And it's like, this is crazy. If McLaurin does what he's projected to do, He's going to be way higher next year, and you will have already gotten the benefit of that of that top twelve season. So McLaurin's a guy I have had in a lot of places. Um, Godwin, I think you have to have in the top ten just because he's so young and he's shown so much. I'm a little bit leery always of slot guys because um, I think the production tends to be more schematic necessarily than than outside wide receivers. Um, and so I, I tend to think it it's a little bit more unpredictable, but I, obviously you see Wes Walker, Julian Edelman can definitely, it's, it's possible to sustain long-term value primarily in the slot. Um, I know I'm forgetting a lot of guys. I had, I had my list earlier. Um, I've been looking at this a lot throughout some names. I'll tell you if I have them in my so, top 10 or so not. So you mentioned that about slots. So that means you have, I'm projecting, you have Juju lower than most. Yeah. I don't know if he's in my top 20 right now. How about how about Ridley? Yes, Ridley's a top ten guy for me. How about uh, DJ Moore? He is on the fringe. I think I I think when I was actually running out names, he was going more like eleven to thirteen. How about one I'm lower on than most, but a lot of people like him. How about Diggs? I like Diggs. Uh, he's been moving up a lot for me recently, just because. I didn't think that he would be a high volume guy in Buffalo. And he is, he's, he's absolutely been a high volume guy. He's yeah. only 27. He's got a good history. Um, I think he'd be around the same range as DJ Moore. He points at me because I was always, I was lower going the season on the Josh Allen digs. And so every week, you know, I, he makes me uh, reminded of those, uh, those thoughts. His, How his production, if you look at like production through a player's first, however many games, um, and I ran, I, I um, popped off a bunch of those lists earlier this year and Diggs shows up on all of them. He was just incredibly productive, incredibly young, incredibly early, um, especially for a later round guy. Um, so it, it's kind of flown under the radar, but he's, he's been extremely productive to this point in his career. And it's interesting that Hopkins and he, everybody was on wide receivers on the new team. They can't do it. Mm -hmm. It was COVID and he and mm -hmm. Hopkins are popping big. Mm -hmm. Who am, I, who am I missing on the wide receivers? Um, he's not a young guy, but what do you believe of like Tyler Lockett? Do you not like him because he's a sl slot, but he's also a deep threat, so he's kind of that dual package. So I've got um, I Tyler Lockett's kind of been a thing with me. I've had him in my in my leagues for years, um, just because I and I've joked that like 
so I would joke about Russell Wilson. I said, one day Russell Wilson's going to be appropriately rated in dynasty leagues. It might be the day he retires, <laughs> but one day it's going to happen. Um, and we've actually reached a point where I think Russell Wilson might be a tiny bit overrated in dynasty leagues, but that happened eventually. I've only been saying that for, I think five years now. Um, and then somebody says, oh, what about Tyler Lockett? And I'm like, Tyler Lockett's never going to be appropriately rated in Dynasty. No. Never going to happen. So I have him. I, I, it's a return yardage league, too. So we count as return yardage. And he has been a top 10 receiver, I believe, in four of the last five years. Um, and he's just every year kills it. The one year he wasn't, he was wide receiver 17. Um, and like... Every time I, I'm just so deep at wide receiver and I'm trying to move wide receivers and I'll mention my other wide receivers. Everybody's always interested. I mentioned Tyler Lockett. It's crickets. Like the best offer I ever got for Tyler Lockett was Van Jefferson and a end of the second round rookie pick. Um, and that's, that's the best, that's the best Tyler Lockett offer I have ever gotten in any of my dynasty leagues. And I own him. I've owned him in multiple places. I don't know what the deal is with Tyler Lockett. I don't know what else he needs to do. Um, I'm a big Tyler Lockett fan. At this point, I think you've missed out on a big chunk of the gravy train. Um, but I, I would absolutely have him in my top 20 dynasty wide receivers. Just above one of the friends of the show, Matt Harmon, for this mm-hmm. season, he's been he was on Allen Robinson, mm-hmm. Tyler Lockett, and Terry McLaurin, way higher than most people. And Ask him about uh, Cordero Patterson sometime. That was that was one of his favorites. But we'll make sure to bring your name up when we do. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but it's interesting because he was hired on all three. Those one at this, I'm going to put my neck out for him and it all worked out for him per- almost perfectly. And he has you to help everybody remember that. Considering his quarterback situation has been Trubisky, Foles, uh, A-Rob, yeah, for, yeah, for, Portals, for Rob, uh, A-Rob, and then Haskins and Kyle Allen for McLaurin. So he was yep. able to project that even though most of the fantasy community was down because yeah. of the quarterbacks how about uh i'll tell you a guy that i've i've he's grown on me uh, as a rookie as brandon Ayuk. i think that i don't know if you watch san francisco play but he looks good to me i don't know if he does to you you know um you probably remember him from the football guys board uh wc uh wdc rob yes um he tweets at seven rounds in april so he did his master's thesis on um, beating the NFL draft, like using analytics to beat the NFL draft. And he has a model. He tested it. He, you know, reserved data, tested it against that data. I mean, like when I say as a model, it's a genuine model. It's not like me just puttering around in Google Sheets. Um, he ran it by his statistics professors, stats PhDs, and they verified it. And they said, yes, you know, like this does outperform the NFL draft. Um, and he's he's worked on his model. And what I like about it is that I feel like a lot of, you know, the so-called a- analytics, the draft analytics, they tend to be like single variable things like, oh, draft, draft big wide receivers. Big wide receivers are good. Okay, well, like Wes Walker, I don't think Wes Walker would be a better wide receiver if he was six inches taller. It, it just doesn't work with what he does on the football field. Um, but Rob does a lot about archetypes. Um, and it basically says like, oh, this, this prospect has very similar physical traits to Wes Welker. So there's a good chance he'll be a successful NFL wide receiver. This prospect has very similar physical traits to, you know, like these guys, you know, this, this prospect's physical traits match up to a whole bunch of nothing. Like there's a bunch of, of high draft pick busts. So there's probably something in his profile that's bad. Um, and so that's how he does it. And he was all over um, his big, his three big plant the flag guys this year were uh, Gibson in Washington, the running back, um, and then Ayuk and Chase Claypool. Ooh. And so it's been a – oh, and um, Albert O, the tight end in Denver. Yeah. Those were his four big guys this year. So it's been a really strong year for him. That's one of those that you uh, you tell everybody the football doesn't spike itself, right? And uh, Yeah. So you didn't know this, but Adam's a Broncos fan too. Same. And so uh, Albert so, O got his first touchdown. Yes. And so yeah. uh, do you worry about Fant with Albert O in town? No. Uh, um, so Dr. Ian Malcolm in Jurassic Park, he has that uh, that line where they're talking about like, you know, how does, you know, how are these dinosaurs going to procreate? And he just, you know, he like says, you know, life finds a way. <laughs> and that's one of my heuristics for uh, for fantasy football. If you're good, 
at some point you're going to be productive. You know, I don't know what that's going to look like. You know, maybe it's like Martellus Bennett where you're stuck behind Jason Witten and eventually you wind up on another team and you're productive there. You know, sometimes it's, it's like Larry Fitzgerald where you think maybe Anquan Bolden's going to monopolize targets, but no, Larry Fitzgerald's better and pretty soon Bolden's gone. Um, Randall Cobb, I got him in a lot of rookie drafts. When he was drafted, he was stuck behind Greg Jennings, Donald Driver, uh, James Jones, Jordy Nelson, Jermichael Finley, like he was sixth in the pecking order, but he's good. And eventually, you know, if, if a player is good, you find a way to get the ball to him. If a player is bad, it doesn't matter how good his situation is. You know, Zach Stacy goes into a situation where there's nobody there. He got, you know, sure, he got a year worth of production, but Zach Stacy was not a good running back. He didn't hold on to it. He was gone. Um, so I tend to think in the long run, if a player is good, he's going to get his. If a player is not good, he's not going to get his. Um, so in terms of whether Albert O succeeds or fails, I think it, it depends very, very little on how good Noah Fant is and quite a bit on how good, you know, he is. And Mark, you mentioned that scenario and I, I'm, I hearken back, you, you uh, said Russ uh, Wilson earlier that when he came, you know, when he was a rookie, totally. they give Matt Flynn all the money. They had mm-hmm. Barris Jackson as the incumbent. Mm-hmm. And who was this transfer from NC State to Wisconsin? And, you know, we'll give the kid a chance. And now everybody, you know, Pete Carroll and the company are like, oh, we knew it, we knew it. They didn't know it because those first two preseason games, they were not really showcasing him that much. Right. And to your point, if you're good, it finds you. Kind of like Darren Waller, right? You know? Right. Jared Cook, Delaney Walker was there in front of others in San Francisco, or you know Michael Turner in front of behind uh, Ladane Tomlinson. Yeah, yeah, Sproles too. Yes, that was a good backfield with yeah, was. Marty Schottenheimer, just like uh, Marty had at uh, the Chiefs with uh, Larry Johnson and and Presomes, right? Yep. So, so for Dynasty, we're. We are turning back the clocks with our knowledge that we have today. Who are who's the first half of the dynasty rookie draft for you? Um, I'm trying to decide if I go Lamb at number one. I think I would still stick with Edwards Hilaire, Edwards E. Lair, I guess it's pronounced, um, and uh, and Taylor is my one and two. Um, I still expect good things for them. I know they haven't really been productive and now they're kind of mired in a timeshare. Um, I'm not really sweating that life finds a way. Um, and then I'd probably go lamb and Jefferson as three and four. Um, Dobbins at five. I don't know who I'd go at six. I mean, I guess, so the next best wide receivers there would be um, Judy, Ayuk, Chenault, Claypool. Yeah, I mean, I think I might still stick with running back at six and go with, with Swift there. Um, also, you have Robinson, if you cared to go to... Jacob. I would... Uh, it's a little high for Robinson for me. Um, I think he'd be more of a back half of the first. I just, I'm always skeptical. He's, he's looked great. His workload has been huge. Um, but, you know, people think that draft capital loses its predictive value a lot faster than it actually loses its predictive right. value. Um, even, even after a year, even after two years, even after three years. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at, I think Thomas Jones is really the quintessential example he had like four bad years in arizona um and everybody's like you know he's never going to be anything um but eventually you know he kept getting chances he kept getting chances and eventually he made the most of them yep how about uh all right here's one and this one you've seen i don't know if you saw joe bryant tweet it and it's been on you and i's uh internal football guys thing for the next five years, the question is both five years and 10 years. You know which one I'm, where I'm going, don't yep. you? Know? Yep. All right. You have four quarterbacks to choose from. Lamar, John, uh, Jackson, Kyler Murray, Burrow, and Herbert, or Herbert, if we want to go to the Louisiana uh, thing. So which one do you take in five years? 
and which one of those do you take in 10? And what's really interesting, I'm prejudicing you, Reese, is the one that got zero love on Twitter was Lamarck. I'd, I'd go Kyler for both. Kyler's I don't like, know. Kyler's like, he's, okay as a passer, but with his- Yeah, he's got to show me he can pass first. Yeah. Yeah. He would be the last of mine of Same. the four. And, uh, but I did read about where, on to your point, where Greg Roman, uh, the, an article, I think it was on um, NFL.com about how they drew the correlation of Roman and with Kaepernick in year yes. two, defenses started figuring them out. Yes, I and he wasn't adaptive and now this is what's happening in Baltimore and I'm not saying I buy into it but it's an interesting theory so on rookie court uh, which ones would you have would, who'd you have one two at five and at ten years uh, to me the five or ten years thing I, that doesn't make a difference to me um, just I, I guess the, the reason he did the five and the 10 is he was wondering if people were down on Lamar because they didn't think he'd make it to 10 years because he runs so much. Um, but, you know, I think young quarterbacks who run a lot tend to grow into old quarterbacks who don't run a lot. You know, who was the last good running quarterback who didn't play well into his 30s? You know, Steve Young did, Russell Wilson is. Yeah. Um, Vic had some of his best years in his 30s in Philadelphia. Uh, Cole Pepper, I guess, would probably be the one. He's the guy who got hurt. Um, but to some extent, you know, like we've seen Tom Brady get hurt. We've seen Peyton Manning get hurt. I don't know that that was necessarily because he was a running quarterback. Um, so I'd have Lamar first on both of those. Um, and then I think the interesting question is um, Herbert versus versus Burrow. Because um, Herbert's been better. Herbert has been generationally good. Um, I've thrown up some historical comps. Um, and it basically his stats look pretty identical to Marino's rookie stats. Um, if you don't era adjust them, if you do era adjust them, really nobody touches Marino <laughs> and, except Greg cook, if you want to go way back. Um, but other than that, I think Herbert has been pretty much the best rookie quarterback we've seen other than Marino. And it's a small sample size and that could very much change over the last half of the season. You know, it could just be a fluke. You know, you look at Mitchell Trubisky through eight games one year, looked like a potential MVP candidate. So crazy things can happen. Um, Rex Grossman, I remember there was an article saying, you know, is Rex Grossman your quarter season MVP? And the answer is no, no, Rex Grossman is not any of your MVPs, but people were seriously asking the question because small sample sizes are crazy. Um, Where did he go to college, by the way? University of Florida. <laughs> Sexy Rexy. So did Ingle Martin. I know. I was just setting you up there because I knew the answer uh, yep. because of the Gator talk earlier. Uh, yep. So this brings an interesting conversation to me. So a lot of people in the fancy world, as we start wrapping up, they want as much rushing production as possible because it raises the floor. In a dynasty, I think that's even more the case because it's the rushing's more predictable. Does that seem reasonable? Um, I haven't thought about it. Maybe. Well, I meant though, like, I don't know if, if you look right. at, let's say Matthew Stafford's past attempt volume, right? it's not consistent. But if I look at a running quarterback's rush attempts, that's fairly consistent per game. You know what I'm saying? I would say, I, I guess I would phrase it like this. I think that a rushing quarterback, I would be more confident would be fantasy viable for as long as he had a job. I just, I don't know that how predictable him keeping his job would be. I, you know, like Tim Tebow would be the example that as long as Tim Tebow's a starting quarterback, he's a starting fantasy quarterback. But if he can't throw the ball, he's not going to be a starting quarterback for long. You know, Vince Young, same thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have any questions as we wrap up? Well, I was going to add on to that uh, for quarterbacks. It's sort of like the reason why we can't predict who would be the next quarterback breakout. Because right. passing, passing is so much efficiency with like yeah. Russell Wilson versus we knew going in that Derrick Henry would get lots of carries. Therefore, he should yep. get lots of yards and, th and lots of touchdowns. So it's a lot easier to predict rushing stats. Like volume. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, volume, and it should come as long as you're not Leonard Fournette and Jaguars. But, yeah, that's a different story. Right. Uh, but for next year, 2021 uh, redraft leagues, who, who are you drafting as the 1-1? One, one? Oh, we're, we're off quarterbacks. We're looking at all players now. Yes. yes. 
or what, who'd be your top three? Yeah. Uh, McCaffrey and Kamara. Um, and Barkley. I, I think it's still pretty chalk. It, it's interesting because if you can get a running back at the top like that, you know that the second, third round turn, you know, if you have the one, 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 two, one, three, the two, three turn, you're getting almost as good receiver as you would with the one, eight, one, nine, one, ten, right? Yep. And tight end, you know, you can get Kelsey or Kittle there if you wanted to go that route. But um, at, we, no one mentioned, uh, you did not mention Zeke. And I believe it was Bob Harris who said that every year at the end of the season, he makes a list of every player that was injured or had a down year because then he can get them at a very much discount. And I believe the same thing will happen to Zeke. But as, you, yeah, probably. Uh, but but you, don't my know, you don't know where the cliff is. So see, this is the, the right. thing is, you don't know where that cliff is. I am hundred percent right. agreement with you. Sorry to cut you off, Adam. No, it's fine. I mean, like Zeke would be my four. I mean, I, I think those are still the four. Um, I've had Zeke fourth of that quartet for the last couple of years. And, and a lot of it's just the receiving's not there as much. Um, for Dynasty, I think an underrated thing that people don't really think about is um, because of all of the suspensions and the run-ins with Roger Goodell in the past, uh, if he has one more domestic violence issue, and I don't, I'm not saying it's likely he does, but I'm saying the possibility exists that he does, um, then he, it's probably a lifetime ban. Um, and so that's a risk with Zeke that I don't think is, is necessarily present for the other ones. So it, I think there's little tiebreakers like that that tend to for me to bump Zeke to the back of the, of the quartet more than the front of the quartet, but I don't have any problem with anybody who puts them in the front. I, I, those four, and unless and until we see, Dalvin Cook's probably working his way in there too. Um, but even Derek Henry, I don't think is quite there yet. I think he's in the next year back. Yep. But you mentioned underrated. I had not heard that, but that is a great point about Zeke's um, domestic violence. It's all about quantifying risks. I mean, I think a lot of the edge in Dynasty is is just being a little bit more aware and more rigorous about the risks involved in everything um, and knowing that, you know, like sometimes good players go bad and being prepared for that. And sometimes bad players become good and being prepared for that and recognizing just how wide the error bars and the uncertainty around everything is. Um, and I think really just approaching it with a sense of humility. Oh, yeah. All right. One other question, and you can laugh at me on this. Since we're talking about risk, we're talking about all that. How do you see Tampa Bay wide receivers playing out in terms of fancy production the last half of the season? Depends a lot on how healthy Mike Evans is. Yep. Um, Even I think, Godwin. what was that? Well, uh, more, than, more than Godwin, I think Evans is the guy there who I feel confident can drive the offense. If, if I had seen Brown play more than one game in the last two years, he would be that guy. But Evans, if healthy, I know can get open, can, can make plays against pretty much any defense in pretty much any scheme. I think Godwin's a little bit more scheme dependent. Uh, and Brown is obviously, you know, a giant wild card. Um, Gronkowski, I think, is still a bit of a wild card. You know, the, there was all the talk about how he's a blocking specialist. And um, I think some of that was tongue in cheek. Um, you know, when Gronk is saying he's a blocking specialist, I think it's a little tongue in cheek. Um, Evans, if he were healthy, would be the guy I, I was most confident was going to get his. Um, I don't think he's necessarily competing with the other guys as much as he's doing his thing. And then the other guys are competing with each other. Um, I don't know how healthy he is. So that takes away the one sure thing. And, and that, that makes it all into a giant, you know, it's a giant mess. Who knows? And so you two thoughts on that, that are pretty interesting to me. One, if you, if somebody thinks they're all three going to hit, it's better to put your eggs in Brady's basket than try to figure out which one will be on a given week. But one of the things, so Adam does a lot of studies on like bye weeks and when you should get hot, and which weeks are worth more. Having Brady and Bridgewater with week 13 buys, how does that factor in some of your redraft valuation? Oh, it doesn't matter. Any, any um, regular season week is going to be as valuable as any other regular season week. The thing is that playoff weeks are, are massively more valuable, whether you know you make the playoffs or not. Um, and the way I think about it is this, you know, um, if, you have the highest score 
in week 16, assuming you have a week 16 championship game, if you have the highest score of the week, you double your chances of winning a title. Right. Now, if you're a lock for the playoffs, you're doubling very high chances. If you're a huge long shot who needs to go on a six game winning streak to close the season, just to make the playoffs, you're still doubling your chances. You're just doubling much lower chances. You know, that week 16 is the single most valuable week of the year. Actually week 15 is as valuable for the same reason, because it's single elimination. But one of those weeks, if you, if you have the highest score of any team in your league that week, it doubles your championship odds. Um, having the highest score in week 13 does not double your championship odds. It just makes you marginally more likely to make the playoffs. So the big key is, um, you know, championships. And, and this is one of the reasons why fantasy football is the most random and unpredictable of all of the fantasy sports um, championship week leverage is just so high and championships are won by the guys who get hot at the right time. Sean yep. Perriman. Yeah. Yep. But with the reason I mentioned that is I have most of my leagues start playoffs week 13. And so to me, having Brady or Bridgewater, if I was counting on either of them, first week of the playoffs, it's a little unsettling. Yeah. And that that's definitely. So um, in a typical setup where there's like six playoff teams and um, two of them are on by in week 14. That makes week 14 half as valuable as week 15 and week 16. But still, weeks 14, 15, and 16 combined are more valuable than weeks 1 through 13 combined. Um, and the exact math is going to depend on when your playoff weeks are. Are these? Are you doing the two-week playoff matchups? Are you doing, you know, is there buys? How many teams are making the playoffs? The exact math can, it can vary, but the end takeaway should be Playoffs are more valuable than the regular season, whether you make the playoffs or not. Yeah, I mean, even if you think you're a long shot to make the playoffs, the playoffs are still more valuable than the regular season. Because if you want to win a title, you have to do well in the playoffs. There's no, there's, there's absolutely no other path to success. You have to do well there. Right. Sort of like how the Ravens were. They won the regular season title. They just didn't mm -hmm. win the playoff title. And mm -hmm. the playoff title is what everyone's going to remember. Yep. Exactly. All right. You have any other questions for him as we close? Adam, it's been great having you on. And uh, so you've done quite a few models. Have you ever done one on if running backs actually matter? <laughs> like I said, I'm more, I, you know, I, I say I have models. I'm, I'm really just, you know, puttering around in Google Sheets. Um, I'm big on heuristics and my heuristics are one of my big heuristics is that the people in the NFL generally have a vague idea of what they are doing. Um, you want to know how, why I believe running back is the least valuable position because NFL GMs pay running backs the least money. You know, if you look at positional value, you look at franchise tag values, running backs are the lowest paid position. So yeah, of course they're the least valuable position, but they're not paid literally nothing. So of course they have value too. I was referring to if Mike Davis versus Christian McCaffrey, should they just not have Christian McCaffrey if they can have someone fill in just as well? Well, if they can have someone fill in just as well for a tenth of the cost, then sure, don't have Christian McCaffrey. It's it's all about relative advantage. Um, is Christian McCaffrey worth as much as they're paying him? I don't know. I, I'll be curious to see what they do with him and how they use him going back. Um, I'm excited about the possibility that McCaffrey gives you of, of splitting him out wide and using him more creatively in the passing game. And that's a dimension that I don't think Davis gives you. Um, but it's, I think it's up in the air whether that dimension is worth the premium you have to pay to have a Christian McCaffrey. I'd imagine it's probably not. Think about the Zeke versus Dak. You know, mm -hmm. re-signing Zeke for all that money means it's harder to sign Zach than yep. Dak because you don't have the money. And Dak's clearly been more important. But the other yep. side of it is, if you look at the, the history of the last few running backs that got big deals, it's easy for me to cherry pick and say Gurley and Le'Veon Bell and those guys. But history really hasn't been that kind to, to running backs getting big three or four year deals when they're 26, 27 years old. Is that, is that a fair statement? Recent history. Um, and it, it I think it's just a question of, you know, I think recent data is always more valuable than old data, but how much more valuable, how much has the NFL changed? You know, can we look back at, you know, extensions from 15, 20 years ago? Do those, are those still meaningful in today's NFL? Can we glean insight from them? Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, the reason people thought 
big wide receivers were the key and everybody wanted big wide receivers is because over a four or five or six year stretch, the best wide receivers who entered the NFL were all big. You had Calvin Johnson, you had Julio Jones, you had AJ Green. Um, Des Bryant wasn't quite as big, but he, you know, he was a sturdy, well-built yeah. guy. Uh, you had Demarius Thomas. Um, and then, but that was, I mean, a lot of that was just small sample size, random is random and you look at the guys who entered after that and they tended you know a lot of the best guys tended to skew smaller um so i wonder is this a meaningful trend is this noise i don't know uh, yeah the the current trend is is looking very very bad for running backs and i i think that's cause for skepticism but um, i also know that 15 years the data looked quite different yes and to your point on size of running backs it always chuckles makes give me a little chuckle when somebody says you know that wide receiver he can't be good because he doesn't weigh x pounds and i was like when did weight correlate to fantasy success for a rookie wide receiver you know what i mean like because their kelvin benjamin should be a star then you know and he wasn't Kevin Funches should be eddie lacy should be a good yeah. wide receiver yeah but and I'll, I'll, on the other hand work done was built like Deshaun Jackson, and he finished his career with 15,000 yards from scrimmage. Oh, yeah. And a great human being that we should talk more about. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, just ask Deshaun Watson. Exactly. I, all I meant is we, we read about these negative stories of these players, and we should be trumpeting the good humans that some, many of them are. Well, yep. thank you for being with us, Adam. We'll have you on maybe later season, uh, postseason sometime soon. And so thanks for making time on your busy schedule, building models, sorry, tongue in cheek there. And uh, cause you are, I, I see you as this guy that's like, okay, I have this problem I wanna solve. Let me go figure out how can I build something to figure out an advantage to take advantage, you know, some way to take advantage. Does that seem reasonable? It's funny. If you ask anybody in narrative Twitter, they'll yeah. tell you, yeah, for sure. I'm part of stats Twitter. And if you ask anybody in stats Twitter, they'll tell you, oh yeah, for sure. He's part of narrative Twitter. You know, yeah. like it's, uh, you know, I kind of occupy one of those, those regions between where to people who don't do a lot with numbers, it looks like I do a lot. And to people who do a lot with numbers, it looks like I'm doing barely anything. And I, I'd say that's probably a reasonable assessment on both sides. Well, the people we know that do a lot with numbers think you do a lot with numbers. How about that? Okay. And so, uh, well, I meant like Scott Barrett, Grant Barfield, Rich Rebar, even Chris Allen. So I, I consider those guys numbers guys. Maybe you don't, but I'll, if you don't, I'll make sure I tell them. But uh, <laughs> those guys are all awesome guys. And yes. so we appreciate you being on, Adam, and sharing your knowledge and just having a casual conversation with us. Hope you have a great week. Thank yeah, you. happy to. You guys, yeah, have a good night too. Thank you. Thank you.